Hello and welcome. A warm welcome to LMU students, faculty, staff, and friends across the virtual art community. On behalf of the Department of Art and Art History in the LeBand Art Gallery, I welcome you to Kaleido LA. I'm Karen Rapp and I'm hosting today's conversation from the Loyola Marymount University campus in Los Angeles. I want to acknowledge that the LMU campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. This academic year, the Kaleido LA series has been presented on Zoom and is archived on the CFA College of Communication and Fine Arts YouTube page. This speaker series has proudly centered artists who identify as BIPOC, an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, as well as members of LGBTQ communities whose artwork and lived experiences foreground issues of social, economic, and racial justice. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived with a link available on the Kaleido LA website. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can write questions or give your reaction throughout the webinar. Your question will be read aloud at the conclusion of today's presentations. Today's event is a conversation between two leading art curators whose work in campus-based museums exemplifies current efforts to decolonize and diversify institutional art collections. I have the privilege to introduce our guests, Dr. Elisa Alexander and Dr. Rebecca Hall, as well as moderator, Dr. Melody Rodari. Thank you all for taking the time to join us here today. Dr. Hall joined the University of Southern California's Pacific Asia Museum in 2018. She serves as the museum's curator and most recently organized the 2020 special group exhibition entitled, We Are Here, Contemporary Art and Asian Voices in Los Angeles. Dr. Hall earned her PhD in South Asian art history from UCLA and her research and publications focus on Buddhist art and practice in Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. Her recent article, Examining Buddhist Banners in Cambodia, was published in the Textile Museum Journal in 2019. Previously, Dr. Hall was visiting assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University from 2013 to 2016. Dr. Elisa Alexander holds the position of Assistant Curator of American Art at the Cantor Art Center since 2018. Dr. Alexander strives to bring forward an expanded vision of American art in the museum and academia to comprehensively understand the history of artwork made in the United States. She collaborates with the Cantor team to develop innovative exhibitions and campus programming surrounding the work of American artists. Together with Dr. Marcy Kwan, she co-directs the Cantor's Asian American Art Initiative, a newly launched initiative dedicated to the collection, preservation, research, and public presentation of Asian American diasporic artists and makers. Dr. Alexander earned her PhD in art history from the University of California, Santa Barbara. My final introduction is Dr. Melanie Rodari, who is the Assistant Professor of Art History at Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Rodari is the co-organizer of today's webinar, and I am delighted to be working in collaboration with her. She is the Southeast Asian content editor for Smart History, as well as an active curator who has organized exhibitions and permanent galleries for the Norton Simon Museum and the USC Pacific Asia Museum in Pasadena. Her research investigates Buddhist visual culture in Thailand and the history of collecting South and Southeast Asian art. Her work has been published by various journals and university presses, including AmerAsia Journal and the NUS Press. She has received fellowships from the Henry Luce Foundation, 
the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She earned her PhD in art history from UCLA. I'm excited to invite my colleague, Melody Rodari, to join me at the virtual podium to lead today's discussion. Thank you, Karen. Um, can everyone hear me? Thank you. Um, thank you, Karen, so much for your introductions. And thank you to Dr. Hall and Dr. Alexander for joining us today. I just want to preface that while discussions about decolonizing our curriculum has been ongoing at LMU, particularly among faculty, staff, and administrators, students are not always included in these conversations that directly impact their learning and their education. So as Karen notes, it's for this reason that the Department of Art and Art History, as well as the Band Gallery, have um, come together to host a series of lectures that actively seek to introduce our students to artists and scholars, such as Dr. Hall and Dr. Alexander, whose work is grounded in promoting social, political, and racial justice. Today's talk will explore what it means to decolonize institutions such as museums, specifically we want to address the colonial implications of collecting Asian art and how previous collecting practices are being examined, critiqued, and transformed. This is a particularly timely discussion in light of increased violence against AAPI communities. So I hope that we can also address how decolonizing efforts can create spaces of healing and also opportunities for greater representation in museums. Um, so I'll open the discussion by posing the same questions to Dr. Hall and to Dr. Alexander with Dr. Hall presenting first. Dr. Hall, um, the question is, how does your work make a difference to decolonize and diversify your institution's collections? Oh, pardon me. <laughs> well, thank you, Melody. And I just want to thank Melody and Karen uh, for inviting me to take part in this discussion. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing at the Pacific Asia Museum, and I am sharing my screen with you now. Uh, and everybody can, you guys can see it, nod. I can see Melody and Elisa. Okay. So this is the USC Pacific Asia Museum. I'm gonna be kind of indirect in how I answer some of these questions. It'll be kind of subtext of what I'm talking about. I just think it makes, makes it interesting. I'm gonna keep my eye on the time <clears throat> so that I, I don't over talk this, this section of the, the, the program, but thank everybody for coming. <clears throat> so I wanna tell you a little bit about the museum. Um, so it's the Pacific Asia Museum, we're part of USC and in fact, uh, the museum is celebrating it's our, our 50th anniversary this year, so we were founded in 1971 and we became part of USC in 2013. So we functioned as an independent standalone museum for, museum for a very long time. Uh, and it's in less than 10 years that we've become a university museum. Uh, and it's really interesting and important to note that this museum is, is uh, specifically focused on Asia and the Pacific Islands. So we're a very specialized museum uh, that ranges our collection, what we do in our galleries ranges largely from Afghanistan to Japan, including South and Southeast Asia, and then across the Pacific Islands. And then the time periods that we cover go from the Neolithic to the contemporary. And so it sounds like, oh, okay, you just do Asia and the Pacific Islands. But of course, I mean, think about how huge uh, of a significant portion of the world that is and the diverse peoples and histories and objects that come across uh, from that region. And I just think uh, it, it's plenty for a museum our size. So we have a surprisingly small but dedicated staff for this large collection. We have a very robust calendar and I am the only curator on staff at our museum. So I just wanna kind of foreground how we talk about this because I know that that stands in contrast, for instance, to what uh, Alisa is going to be talking about and, and the museum that she is at. So you walk into our historic building and, and you see that the, the galleries are <clears throat> uh, the permanent collection galleries, which were reinstalled in 2017 and, and reopened, focus on the different regions in Asia so that as you walk through the galleries, you are kind of taking a physical tour of the regions that we cover. 
uh, starting with South and Southeast Asia, or starting with the Pacific Islands, moving through South and Southeast Asia into the Him Him Himalayas, uh, to the arts of China, Japan, and Korea. And, and that's the way that we present things permanently. That's the way we kind of talk about our collections. And I'm gonna say that one of the things I love about this museum is that we have the advantage of being located in Los Angeles. It might be a no brainer for all of us who are located in LA, but you know, LA is sometimes called the capital of Asian America. And we have this diverse, long-standing, well-established uh, neighborhoods filled with uh, groups from across the Asia and Pacific world. And I think that these communities are what I love about Los Angeles and what I think uh, I'm gonna talk about as I talk about our museum. As a curator, my, my kind of philosophy, my, my urge in what I try to do when I'm curating things in the galleries and, and exhibitions is that it's really important for me to people to understand that Asia is this incredibly diverse place. So we kind of, we kind of simplify it in the galleries and the nature of museum work. We have to simplify because we have to present things that people can read and understand. But it's this incredibly diverse place, so many different groups of people with all these different histories. And I also very important to understand that, especially now for, for several centuries and longer, Asia doesn't end where the continent ends. And I always say that when I talk to people about what I'm doing, because uh, I, when we confine a group or we confine people to uh, a landmass, it gets, uh, con it's confining, right? It, 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 it's limiting how we think about uh, our groups. And so, so the, all of that's kind of the foundation of, of what I'm gonna talk about today. And so as a curator, it's really important for me to think about how to present these things in galleries and in exhibitions, uh, objects in our collection, um, various uh, contemporary art by breaking down the mystery and exoticism of Asia, right? Um, and and, and that, that is one of the things that I am working on. I'm working on the China Gallery in different ways to present things in our China Gallery with that understanding. So you look at our collection and you get the things that you expect to see from Asia um, uh, and the Pacific Islands. I, I ran out of space, so I just did Asian objects here. But things you expect to see are gonna be in our galleries. That means we're gonna have golden religious images, images from stone. We're gonna have uh, dragon robes and landscape paintings and prints from Japan. And all of this you will see and it confirms kind of what people understand and know about Asia. But as, as a curator, what I'm trying to do is kind of expand beyond that and think about, okay, this is kind of the, what is it, like almost like the canon of Asian art history, but what are we missing when we're just choosing the objects that confirm what we already kind of know and expect? There's a lot of words on here and it's just for myself because I don't have like something in front of me to otherwise um, think about. But for USC PAM, these questions of decolonization are about learning more about our collection they're about creating access for everybody, being inclusive in what we display in our galleries, which I'm talking about a little bit at the beginning here, having a variety of programs that can address issues that are much more complex than what we have in our galleries, and then creating dynamic exhibitions that highlight diverse voices and perspectives. And we've committed to doing this by, by saying we're deconstructing Orientalism rather than saying we're decolonizing our museum. Because I think that the study of Asian art and the display of Asian art is really built upon the concept of the Orient and Orientalism. Um, it, and we wanna break that down. You know, Orientalism, if you look at it from the Said perspective, which I'm not gonna do, uh, they think about it as the Near East, but as we expanded in time and place, for the Americans, it's often the East uh, and attempts to honor the East and show the East as this other part of the world uh, can be as damaging uh, as, as anything else. And so you create this exaggerated mythic construct and how, how do you change that? Um, and so we see that feeds into a lot of the anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing manifesting so ugly in our country right now. Uh, and so it's, it's been my perspective as a curator to figure out how to, how to move against that, but now it's just become much more urgent and much more visible. So one of the things we do is, uh, for me as curator, accessing the collections is important, which means giving the public full access to our collections through online access, digging into our enormous permanent collection. And I say 16,000 objects or more is a lot for a tiny museum with one curator and one registrar. Um, 
And so we, one of the issues I'll show you is that we actually need to figure out exactly what we even have, figure out how we can display and discover things that aren't in our collection. Again, to fill out that story and not just stick to the usual canonical um, items and working really hard not to fall into old patterns and reinforce some stereotypes, right? So you can access it online. A lot of the things are photographed, but if you actually start digging into our collection anyway, you'll find things like this with very little information. And I feel like the first step for us, if you really wanna create access and you really wanna create this concept of decolonizing museum, you've got to figure out what you have. And so that's a priority for us. Um, easier said than done. Highlighting the diverse voices and I'm just zooming through this cause I forgot to set my timer. <laughs> And so I have no idea how long I've been talking. I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, I'm just giving you an overview because there's a lot, we are doing a lot at this tiny little place to figure this out. But for me, really my focus has been highlighting diverse voices and perspectives. And this is what I'm doing this year. This is what I'm doing moving forward. This is what I'm kind of beating the drum of as curator. Uh, and so what does this mean? You can say you're highlighting this and doing that, but it's really how you apply it that it becomes important. And in museums is very clear how you're applying these concepts because it's a public institution that everybody can visit when COVID is not happening. Or people can visit our website and see how we're doing it in that way. So, uh, so that means listening. And I've talked about this with other people, but as curator, we often don't describe curators as listener, but I listen a lot. As soon as I took this position, I just listened to what our museum community was saying to me about our museum or about our galleries or about their experiences and perceptions of what our museum is. Because if I hear people that I'm talking to say, oh, well, your museum has never really worked with our community or we don't see your museum as representing our community, I see that as a red flag. And so my work has, once I started hearing things like that, my work has been to change that because I think that that just feeds into Orientalism and these concepts of Asia as the other. If we're presenting things in our galleries and not connecting with the rich, incredible uh, communities we have in our own backyard. Knowing that my voice needs to be turned down in favor of other perspectives, right? So what are other people discussing in terms of objects, how can other people besides my curator, my academic training, show us how to look at objects in galleries. Remembering that sometimes expertise is not about knowledge that you've built over years through reading and research, but actually acknowledging what we do not or cannot know. Thinking about how to counter confining our biased perspectives by embracing new narratives. How do we keep from falling into old patterns? And again, that's a really challenging question in the museum world. And then finally, collaborating with education and program colleagues and, and using their uh, skills and their perspectives to really fill out that attempt. So for instance, I would love to talk to respective communities about objects in our galleries and, and hear from them what their perspectives are on these objects or how they can even create narratives around these objects, aside from the fact that this is a Guan Yin made out of jade and blah, 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 the standard kind of thing you expect a curator to say. And so we have two representations of Avalokiteshvara from different parts of Asia. And we can, by talking to communities of which we have such rich, rich examples in our, in our backyard, like I said, and seeing how these things mean different things or similar things to those communities. And one of the initiatives I'm working on is to create kind of community gallery labels scattered throughout our museum that would embrace that. And then the thing that I didn't want to talk too long and miss is my contemporary art and, and special exhibition work that I've been doing, uh, of which I, I, after hearing that, you know, we need to incorporate and work with our communities more and thinking about my need to expand how we understand and, and discuss Asia, uh, keeping Asia rather than at arm's length, but more of a hug is kind of how I think of it, um, is this exhibition, We Are Here Contemporary Art and Asian Voices in Los Angeles, which opened right when COVID closed everything down, in which I worked with seven artists, all working and based in Los Angeles, uh, of various Asian heritages to create their artwork um, <clears throat> and display their artwork about whatever it is that they're working on. So I went into the community and found these seven beautiful and wonderful women 
um, whose work were displayed in our galleries. And it's really just bringing that conversation together. And I think contemporary art has a very special role to play in this process. So this is just one gallery view that you find when you're walking in. And again, because I want to bring my voice out of it and really foreground the voice of our artists and communities, you'll see different things scattered throughout the galleries that do that. We also have a series of, of like kind of bio documentaries uh, that we created that give you more of an understanding of who these artists are and their histories and heritages and how they build from who they are to create this artwork that I think is accessible to all and really tells these stories. Finally, I am doing a kind of a bookend to that exhibition for our 50th year anniversary in which I'm working with seven artists, all of different Asian heritages who, who are Asian American um, in a project that we're doing this fall called Intervention Perspectives for a New Pam, in which they are actually working and creating artwork, looking at our collection, looking at our history, and in response to that, so that it's very much an exhibition that is based on what Pam is and ways to move forward in thinking about these questions that I'm laying out for you. So here you see photographs of the artists. Um, and it's just an absolute thrill for me that they all wanted to be a part of this exhibition. It's something that's opening in November. Um, and then, um, and then uh, this is just some examples of their work. And it's important to me that they all work very differently and from different perspectives. But I think that if you're gonna bring in these community voices, <clears throat> excuse me, and if you're going to um, think about you know, inviting people to tell you or think about different ways to look at and be inclusive in your in your exhibition. I think this is an excellent way to do it. Uh, and so, so there's this is examples of how you can take these questions and really and move them along. And again, in this exhibition, it's not my main curatorial thrust is who I choose and how I talk with them, and then eventually how we're presenting the work in the galleries. But hopefully for me, my goal is that when you walk in the galleries, you're not thinking about me in any way, shape or form. You're really engaging with the works and contemplating what does a museum dedicated to the Asia Pacific world mean for communities in the United States. Uh, communities that are diasporic, because I think that's a question that doesn't get asked as, as much as it needs to. And I think moving forward, it's something that we must ask in a museum like this, where this is what we are dedicated to. So um, that's pretty, I don't, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I, I'm looking forward to your questions and thoughts, but that's my perspective on this, this long, deep, heavy question that we're discussing here. trying to stop my share. I forgot how to do it. Sorry, guys. There you go. Um, thank you, uh, Rebecca. And I love so much of what you said. I love you speaking about how Asia doesn't end where the continent ends. I feel like every person of Asian descent feels that, that who lives in the United States. And that I really love the approach of um, deconstructing Orientalism in this context, because I think that's so extremely important. And so to my end, um, in answering your question, Melody, I'm also going to share my screen and talk um, a little bit about the Cantor, which is one of two art museums on Stanford's campus. It's the Cantor Art Center, and then we have the Anderson Collection, and they are sister museums that are right next to each other on campus, in case you have not visited us. And um, one unique uh, issue that I face that's different than what Rebecca faces is that this is an encyclopedic museum that's been around um, since 1891. So um, we have a different set of issues and we are approaching things in a different way given that we are sort of encyclopedic. I wanted to start um, with a CNN article that I had read uh, last year um, in 2020, that great year of 2020, that was talking about um, the abolition of museums and the rewriting of American history and these issues around decolonization. And it was very striking to me because I do not recall uh, as you know, a person going through the academic system, the conversation surrounding equity in museums and representation being so much in public consciousness as it has been recently. And I find that to be extremely powerful uh, because it means that communities and visitors are invested in what museums do, which is actually a really exciting opportunity for us. When I was an undergrad and talked about going into museum work, it still seemed like such a rarefied 
field, which granted, of course it is, um, but the fact that CNN would run an article about museum abolition was striking to me. And so I just wanted to break down a couple of options or visions for the future in museums where what are we talking about when we talk about abolition versus uh, museum reform? And so, you know, the idea if you're working in museums now and you want to do it responsibly is that you have to recognize that the structure itself is built on a colonial and imperialist mo uh, model. And a lot of the objects that are in our collections come from that very impulse. And so um, there is a line of thinking that museums perpetuate violence through their very existence and that they need to be dismantled. On the other hand, um, there are thoughts about museum reform and just thinking about the ways that museums can reform their policies and structures to make them more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. And in my mind, that demands a redistribution of resources. Either way, it demands a redistribution of resources, which I think is a really important thing to talk about um, going forward, because a lot of institutions can speak publicly about how they want to be diverse and inclusive, but if you look behind the scenes and the framework and the structure and where things are, um, where the budgets uh, actually have their funds placed, that will tell you more about what a museum's priorities are than any public statements they may make. Um, and so I, I wanted to just um, relay an anecdote uh, sort of about myself and also about this artist Bernice Bing because I believe that it sort of runs parallel to a lot of these discussions that we're having in museum decolonization. Um, and when I was an undergrad, I do not ever recall being taught the work of a single Asian American artist. And it wasn't until later in graduate school um, that I was introduced to the work of some Asian American artists. And I think if it would have happened earlier for me, that it would have changed the trajectory of my intellectual career. I have no regrets in terms of the way that things had panned out for me. Um, I did my graduate work on Southern contemporary black art, which was amazing and extremely rewarding. And I, uh, you know, I absolutely have no regrets in that regard, but that was my initial field of study. So this now being a co-director of an Asian American art initiative is a unique position for me to be in because it is also not um, what I studied in graduate school and neither was it what my counterpart, Professor Marcy Kwan studied in graduate school either. So this is something that um, we see that hap you know, happens everywhere is that there's not necessarily a, an access to this type of material. So, um, when I was in graduate school, I was a teaching assistant for my um, graduate advisor's class on the history of art in California. And she uh, taught a lecture on the artist Bernice Bing, a great Chinese American artist who was born in San Francisco's Chinatown. She went to California College of the Arts and San Francisco Art Institute, both really important, um, historically important institutions in the Bay Area. She was a student of Richard Diebenkorn. Um, she counted among her friends, uh, Joan Brown and Jay DeFeo. She was a great arts advocate, um, was the first executive director of the Soma Arts Center. You know, her CV goes on and on. Um, so safe to say during her life, she was a very active artist and yet for, in many respects was not written about in art history at all. Um, and so I, you know, she always stuck in my head after graduate school of me kind of wondering why was it that I never really heard um, much about an artist like this? And surely, of course, there had to be many more artists of Asian descent who were truly contributing to the history of American art. And yet their, um, their legacies and their respective practices were just not being addressed in scholarship. Uh, on the right, I will return to it, but on the right is an example of her work from the 60s that was recently acquired by the Cantor and um, working with the estate of Bernice Bing. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more after I talk about um, some of the challenges that she faced during her life. Um, she, uh, you know, always struggled to find homes for her artwork, um, and a lot of her artwork has since been lost. Here's a exhibition that an important exhibition that she was featured in in 1990 um, in San Francisco. And I like to think about, you know, when we have all these discussions and questions about what can museums do and why do we need institutions and how does this relate to the history of Asian American art? Well, we can do things for the legacy of artists um, that, you know, other types of institutions do not because there are a lot of amazing artist run nonprofits out there and the burden has been traditionally placed on communities of color to do their own representing and collecting and archiving of their own collections. 
And that's a problem because larger institutions that have bigger budgets and more money are not investing in preserving the artwork and archives of these artists. And so in my mind, this is the role that museums can really play in terms of decolonizing our collections and our archives is really investing in this material that we've you know, ignored for so long and taking the burden off of the communities of having to do that work solely themselves. Um, and so this is just some history about Bernice Bing. So, it, um, you know, just anecdotally, I, I never forgot about bingo. And so when I started at the Cantor, which is, of course, in the Bay Area, I um, reached out to the estate and we began working with them. And so through our conversations, we were able to take the archives of Bernice Bing to Stanford, which now they are being accessioned and part of special collections at Stanford University. Um, and this is, I just love, this is a behind the scenes shot of, you know, what it takes. It's just, you know, normal sort of um, unglamorous work sometimes, just taking archives and boxes um, back, to, uh, back to a campus. And that in itself is a kind of, it's a powerful act and it's one that um, really can help change an artist's legacy. Because if you think about it, if you're a young graduate student and you want to do research on an artist like Bingo, if these types of archives are not readily accessible and the artworks are not readily accessible in institutions, you don't really know where to go and you don't know how to access it. And sometimes estates don't really understand how to work with scholars and researchers and they don't have the resources in order to be able to do so. Um, so I just wanted to highlight uh, Bingo and think about you know, working as an institution with one artist like that and then thinking about all of the amazing Asian American artists out there who have not had institutions support them in any significant way and what we can do in that regard. Um, so one more thing about this painting that we had acquired from the estate is that, as is often the case with artists of Asian descent um, in the United States, they, their artworks need um, attention and care and conservation. This painting was very badly damaged in a fire at Soma Arts, um, where Bingo was the executive director. So the upper right half of the painting was all burned down. And then the artist had to come in and patch it, patch it and repaint it. So she did patch and repaint it um, towards the end of her life, which is very profound. And But then it has since been kept in unideal storage conditions, which now the amount of conservation that is required to bring this up to exhibitable level is extensive. And so this is another way that institutions can pool their resources, which is con conserving works, um, which is very expensive uh, and bringing them into the public eye. So this is something that um, we are endeavoring to do um, with the Asian American Art Initiative. And so um, when I arrived at the Cantor in 2018 and began conversations with Professor Marcy Kwan, we, um, she had already had this project in the works. She teaches one of the only recurring um, undergraduate courses on the history of Asian American art in the country. And uh, so, of course, you need a museum counterpart if you want to do this. So this is where I wanted to step in. Um, Asian American art remains one of the most underdeveloped areas of American art history. And it is a challenge because we're talking about multiple diasporas across time being united under this one very broad term. Um, and, but you know, that being said, there are 20 million people of Asian descent nationally with a quarter of those people in California. Um, and the Bay Area with its long and important history, um, especially San Francisco as a port city, seemed like the right place to do it. And to be frank, Chinese um, Americans were employed by Leland Stanford to physically build the university itself. So we you know, consider this a kind of debt to them and, that, and their history. Uh, and while there are many institutions who are in, um, devoted to the study of Asian American art, being a collecting institution puts us into a kind of unique perspective or a unique position because we are able to bring things into our collection and care for them. And as Rebecca talked about, it's no small feat. And I'm amazed at the number of objects that you have in your collection with one registrar and one curator. We have um, 37,000 objects in our collection and definitely more than one registrar and four curators. And so it's a big, um, it's a big task. Uh, how am I doing on time here? Um, just checking the time. Something that I've been um, thinking about and puzzling over 
Um, and this is just a SketchUp model. Uh, SketchUp, of course, is a program that curators um, have our preparators put together when we want to dream of exhibitions and we don't need to actually put them in the physical space, is the idea of what it would mean to dedicate a gallery space for um, Asian American and Asian diasporic art. And this butts up a lot against a lot of current conversations about um, assimilation versus segregationist types of curatorial strategies about why not just bring in a collection of Asian American art and assimilate it into your larger collection and just place Asian American artists in um, conversation with other American artists, for example, because they too are American artists um, versus creating a separate gallery space. Um, and so these are some of the issues that arise in this discussion. And I'm still uh, sort of puzzling out what the right approach is in talking to other scholars and other curators and other community members. And I of course welcome everyone's thoughts um, about what it would mean to do this because there has long been crit critiques of ethnically or culturally specific uh, galleries within encyclopedic institutions. Um, in my mind, you know, I have never, or very rarely, now that I've had a little bit more experience, very rarely been in a space that is exclusively devoted to Asian American art. Um, and I do think that that in itself is a powerful, um, physical, somatic experience that I would love to be able to provide for students and visitors to be able to walk into a space and see that kind and feel that kind of representation that has not something that even I myself have felt and um, you know I'm still reasonably young so it should have <laughs> like this stuff like this should have already happened by now right um, and I think it provides a kind of impact to be able to see all that material together however I see the downsides because you could say that this is not an inclusive approach that this is perpetuating ideas of otherness that it is not incorporated into larger conversations about the history of American art um, depending on the gallery, and these are important real things to think about, um, it could be marginalized within the museum itsp itself because not all spaces within museums are created equal, and, um, and we know that. So, um, you know, as part of the Asian American Art Initiative, um, we are working towards organizing a series of ex exhibitions, which are just the first of many, that will take place in fall of 2022. And they will feature a lot of these recent acquisitions that I just wanted to touch base and share with everyone during my final few minutes. Um, and then I welcome conversation um, and just talk about what it means to build a collection. Um, so luckily the Cantor has had resources and we've had institutional support to, to do this project because it does require resources, right? Um, and we want to build the preeminent collection of Asian American art because there are very few in the country. The Smithsonian has a good collection, um, but in California, when it comes to specifically the artistic production of Asian Americans um, in an encyclopedic context, that doesn't really exist. So we were very excited to acquire Ruth, the great Ruth Asawa's Wall of Masks, which is 233 ceramic masks that she made of her friends, families, and fellow artists, um, ceramic impressions that she hung on the outside of her home. And this is such a beautiful community piece that is like a living archive of her life and um, really challenges what we think we know about Asawa. Uh, this is an image of her doing it and here a close up of some of the masks. So we're um, in the process of evaluating all of them right now. We also brought in 151 objects from the collector Michael Brown who uh, assembled one of the best collections if not the best collection of Asian American art by artists working in California. Um, so this is now within the Cantor's collection and we're working on making it accessible online. Similar to Rebecca, we know that that's really, we have issues there as well, that that's the thing that can make it accessible to everyone is really providing that platform so that people can see these objects. Um, but this was all done during the pandemic. So this is still very recent for us. And finally, I just wanted to end with one of these works from the Michael Brown collection and a kind of beautiful meditation and these sort of speculative possibilities that are present within this very, um, you know, what one might consider to be conventional, quiet, still life painting by Toshio Aoki, who was one of the first artists of Japanese descent documented to have been working in the state of California. 
um, and he uh, worked in the late 19th century. He came over, he was primarily known for his um, Nihonga style watercolors. And this is the only known oil painting by the, this artist. Oil painting, which is of course associated primarily with the Western canon, you see Aoki kind of dip his toe into it. And what he chooses to depict are um, persimmons that are cradled in a basket made by a person of indigenous descent, uh, presumably. Um, and this is 1895. And so, um, it, this painting brings to mind so many things, you know, persimmons, of course, are the national fruit of Japan, and they were actually brought over um, in the mid 19th century, um, just as Aoki came over in the uh, mid late 19th century. And um, indigenous peoples, of course, during this time were under um, great threat and persecution as well. So I think about the way that Aoki is uniting immigrant and indigenous histories in the very conventional form of an American still life painting. And I think about what it would have meant for me um, if I would have been able to have access to an object like this within a museum collection and to think about what that means about the history of American art and how diverse it actually has always been, but that has not necessarily been represented in museums. So um, apologies if I have spoken too long, uh, but I was just excited to share all of these things, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you to you both. The work that you guys are doing is so impressive and so commendable. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, Lisa, that um, as a graduate student myself, uh, and even as an undergraduate student in my entire academic career, I did not have one course that covered or included an, uh, an Asian American artist. And I'm sorry to say that I am perpetuating that here at LMU and not teaching uh, courses myself um, and that my own training has been one that really reflects sort of colonial attitudes, right? That I am a specialist of Buddhist art of Thailand and not just Buddhist art of Thailand, but the royal Buddhist arts of Thailand, no less. <laughs> Um, but thank you to you both. I want to open up the discussion to our audience um, who've been sitting very patiently. Um, I know that we have uh, one comment and um, Molly, I know that you traditionally read off these questions, but um, I'm going to go ahead and, and read it off if you don't mind. Um, this comes from my colleague and the chair of the Department of Art History. And it's from Dr. Damon Willick and he writes, thank you, Drs. Hall, Alexander and Madari for this conversation. Um, can you distinguish for us the difference between deconstructing the museum versus de uh, decolonizing it? So I'm not sure who wants to take that question first. Okay, why don't you go for it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I see how you work now, Elisa. No, I'm just kidding. Oh no, I thought I, you. <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, it's, a, it's, it's exactly a great question. Um, I think the two go hand in hand, right? Because museums are built on a, like a colonial perspective. And so I think what's difficult about talking about decolonizing the museum is that it can be about, and that's why I try to approach in my talk is that it's a, it can be about the collections, it can be about the exhibition of objects, but really to me, I think it's about thinking and think how we think about things and how we present them. So to me, the two things are, are hand in hand. It just so happens that we work on a part of the world that is under the umbrella of colonization and whose, whose objects have been approached from kind of a colonial perspective. So personally, I see it as very much a similar kind of uh, thing. Yeah, and to that I would add, I think, um, especially larger museums and museums in Europe too, decolonizing also specifically refers to the repatriation of objects that were brought in during the process of imperialism and that, um, or even in the United States, the repatriation of indigenous objects to their communities, for example, or really thinking about provenance and the way that museums have come to acquire their collections. And um, often, um, you know, we assume, I think sometimes there's an assumption in the general public that there are, have long been these very established procedures in place for the way that museums get things. And actually that's not necessarily the case. And this is all um, sort of rather new. And so um, thinking about repatriation, examining our collections, thinking about where we got things from. Um, and then also the same things that Rebecca was talking about, 
Um, decolonizing can also mean increasing accessibility, um, diversifying the collection, and I think deconstructing is, goes into that because that's also about being transparent about structures and the ways that museums actually work. To that end, I would also add that as much as it is important to um, think about collection building, which is I know what I talked about for the most part, um, it is important to think about the ways that museums are structured hierarchically. They serve as very hierarchically reinforced institutions. That's the way that um, the power structure often works. And if we want to diversify not just what we hang on our walls, but who works in a museum, we do really need to think about policies and procedures that are put in place um, and whether or not these are access accessible and inclusive um, and are welcoming to people from very different backgrounds as well. While we wait on additional questions from the audience, I was wondering if you had questions for each other. I know that we don't often get a chance to be with one another these days. Um, so uh, not to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> um, if not, I do have a question that just came up, but um, again, I'll... Well, I would just love to know, um, Rebecca, what, I mean, you've featured some uh, of your current projects and up, I'd love to know more about what the future holds. Are you excited on any things that you're working on now? Because I know that museum work is long and we work on things for many years and it takes a long time for them to come to fruition. <laughs> I am, I'm actually really excited um, about this prospect of adding community labels or finding a way to incorporate like a, a different kind of voice into our galleries. And um, Valentina Quezada, who's our education, like, I don't know, all around education person. I can't remember her title. Sorry, Valentina. Um, and I are going to have a Getty intern this summer who's going to help initiate that project. I'm really excited about that. I feel like it's, Again, it's 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 taking this understanding of what objects are and what museums are and kind of uh, expanding it. And I'm I, I'm really focused on the exhibition I was talking about, Intervention, our 50th anniversary exhibition. Um, I get a lot of I'm not trained in contemporary art in any way, shape, or form. Although I come from a studio art background, uh, but we are here was my first time ever working with contemporary artists. But I get a lot of pleasure from it, and I really love seeing seeing what artists do. And, and I'm really excited to see what this exhibition is gonna shape up to be. So our, at, at PAM, our calendar is uh, like much, like everything else, super intense. So we don't think very far in advance because we just don't have that luxury. But, uh, but that's my, I, so basically a lot of what I talked about, I'm excited to see it come into fruition. And I really wanna establish these, these, these better, stronger links with our communities. So we have a question from our audience and the question reads, um, what do you think about any disconnection or tension with regards to the relationship between the collector who tends to be Anglo-American and art created by Asian and Asian-American and AAPI artists? If you'd like me to repeat that question, I can. No, I see it here. Oh, okay. Ooh, that is a question. That's a very good one. Great. It's a great one. And it's a lot of this in, in some ways, it's some of the subtext of what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about without being quite so direct, I guess maybe I should, but it, you know, because the museum and, and the collection of Asian art is that's kind of this Orientalist thing. And so I think that's why the next question for me is how, what's our next step, right? Because I think that Otherwise, we're continuing to present it from this kind of Western European Ameri Anglo American collector perspective. And so I want to break that down. The objects are here now. Yes, we know about, um, you know, repatriation and those things, but what are other ways to work through that? And so I think that that's, that's a lot of what I'm asking. I don't have the answer yet. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I think anybody who works with Asian American or Asian collections has to grapple with this. I um, commend my colleagues at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco that have done good recent work acknowledging um, their the founding of their collection and Avery Brundage and all as a very problematic person. And I think, you know, that serves as a good example of being transparent and not sort of hiding these histories of where things come from in collections and 
um, that exposes the these histories. If you can be transparent and um, respectful to the objects, but also um, disclose very earnestly, sometimes where museums get these things from, I don't see anything wrong in that. I see that as a great opportunity for education um, to the general public about the history of imperialism and how museums are built and how things come into collections and how it's all tied up with power um, and access and these types of things. So um, it, I don't know if that fully answers it. It's just one thing that comes to mind is always transparency in this regard. Yeah, and you know, for me, it, it because I, I do write about issues of collecting as well and display, um, you know, the, the personal tastes of a collector, right, has such a huge impact on what gets collected in museums. And that's why traditionally when you see Asian art being collected by museums, because they're oftentimes gifts, they're not purchases by the museum as, you know, as you had mentioned, they tend to be material that is religious, right? And that's because this was considered the apex, um, what was regarded as being acceptable to, to collect because this is, again, part of the colonial process. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering, you know, particularly for you, Rebecca, with your collection, um, the possibility, because there is such a large diasporic community here in Los Angeles, of bringing those you know, religious communities of which your collection collects, right? Bringing those communities into your museum so that they can potentially curate their, the objects from which are part of their living traditions. And I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Rari because um, she, she curated a really brilliant exhibition that I think is an example of that, even though that is is working with the Thai Buddhist community here. But I think I think that that's part of the larger question of, of working with communities. I think it's a great idea. I, I just don't know. I think that I, what's interesting about Pam is that it's a, it's kind of different from what you expect from like the big Asian art museum of San Francisco or the large encyclopedic museums like Blackmore or the Met in that it is kind of this it's I think of us as this you know scrappy museum and we kind of worked with the community and people donate things and a lot of it's not necessarily what you expect uh it doesn't really fit into the the paradigm that we're so used to with museums and so I think that's part of what's so great about it and moving forward in this way um but we do so we just have to again in, in figuring out what we have it's part of that larger question of figuring out uh who collected and why. So we, we have a huge challenge. I think we've got plenty of work cut out for us in this regard. Yeah, I think that's always the challenge is how much private collectors have really shaped narratives about what is and is not collectible or worthy of exhibition or study. And that goes across any department in any museum, not just Asian art or Asian American too. Um, and how we can be respectful to these often generous donations. And we want more donations as well. Um, but also acknowledging that this is all how history is constructive and it's never just straightforwardly objective, that it is often when it comes to art shaped by the tastes of others um, and reckoning with that in our own work and research as well. Um, as we continue to wait for questions from our audience, um, what I was struck by, Elisa, when you were talking about the pros and cons of putting together your uh, exhibition spaces for your Asian American, um, I'm, I'm assuming this is for the permanent collection rather than. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is it, beyond it, a temporary exhibition, yeah. So it, it struck me that, you know, um, that it's sort of the a same conversation that you would probably be having too, Rebecca, and maybe you guys can both talk about it because, um, you know, it, it's, by presenting Asian American art in a certain light, either being part of a larger narrative or having its own narrative, um, you know, that's a similar conversation that you, I imagine, are having, Rebecca, in your collections with um, just material from, from Asia, right? Is, you know, because we know that there's trade and there's influence and there's all this stuff happening, mm -hmm. but it's what we rely on as academics and as curators often is to put things in categories and taxonomies because it's easier for us, right? To have a 
type of narration to provide for our audiences who may not have a background. So I'm wondering if you both can sort of um, maybe speak to that question comment. <laughs> Um, can you sort of, sorry, Melody, can you kind of repeat? That's all right. I don't know where I was going either. Um, <laughs> I guess I just wanted to, to, um, to just tease out, you know, what you're both thinking as you're putting together your permanent galleries. Yeah. Um, you know, where things in. Waste. I can jump in while Elisa, because Elisa, I love that you talked about that. It is so important. And you just kind of have to stick some, like pick something and stick to it. It's yeah. really <laughs> difficult because you know that there can be all these different ways yeah. of doing it. And I don't know, there is no right way. We kind of get used to doing it a certain way. And if you break from that tradition, just know that you, like, it's going to bring value in other, in, in other ways. If I had been part of the museum when, when the galleries went in, would I have advocated for them to be separated by geography? Does that flatten uh, our understanding of Asia? I don't know. Yeah, because I don't have to. <laughs> but I, I mean, I love that question, Elisa. And I think, especially with the Asian American material that you're talking about, I see it when I talk about the exhibitions I'm doing, this incredible thirst for that material to be visible cannot be understated. Like scream it from the rooftops. Uh, people are thirsty for it. And this representation is in dire need. And so like, can you walk both sides of the line where you have a section dedicated to the Asian American collection and incorporate them into the yeah. uh, American galleries or something. Can you have your cake yeah. and eat it too? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's totally, that was sort of my answer is that like, why can't we do both? Why can't we be highlighted? Why can't we be part of the permanent collection? Why can't we do all the things that um, historically white artists have never been bound to like these types of, they can go everywhere and do <laughs> anything in terms of museum collections. So like, why not? Um, so yeah, that also was basically my thought as well. I think there's power in both. It's different registers of power too, like being able to be in a space that is only of Asian American like artistic production versus being in a space that is the reflection of the diversity of American art, but also includes that of the uh, of Asian Americans. So it's just different, um, you know, effective registers. Mm -hmm. So I have one question um, remaining in Q and A that comes from a, a student, um, and it reads: "Thank you for this meaningful and important conversation. Do you have any advice for students that plan to work in museums in the future?" <laughs> Um, are you sure? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we need we we need young people. Thick skin. Um, no, yes. I'm kidding. we're terrible. Uh, we need everybody to be engaged with museums, right? And that's exactly the what if we are going to keep museums as a viable uh, component of our world, then we need people to be coming in with a you know just experience. Getting experience in museums is like is invaluable. Yeah, I think, you know, get ex as much experience um, as early on as much as you can, because museums are very particular types of places and, you know, explore the different roles. Curator is but one role of many very significant roles in a museum. So the more experience that you have, the more you can figure out whether or not that's the place you want to be and what role you think about playing in that place as well. And thankfully more museums are um, paying young people for their labor. It didn't, I have, I'm sure you did too, Rebecca, I've had many an unpaid internship. I'm hoping that those get done away with altogether because that's mm -hmm. not okay. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that is not as much of a problem um, that you would encounter. Yeah, yeah. I, I second that and go into it knowing, knowing that you're not gonna change everything uh, at a museum and knowing that we're all trying to fix problematic power structures and issues, but that, and that each museum is very, very different. Like we talk about museums as this thing, but really, and that's why I emphasized so much at the beginning, the kind of what our museum is, because you, you can work at three different museums and have three very different experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Museums are slow changing institutions, but it doesn't mean that they won't. Um, <laughs> and so it's, we need young people to come in and put pressure and um, create new visions for us as well. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually, if you guys are willing to entertain it, I know that's 115 and I wanna be um, mindful of your time. This question comes from my colleague, Dr. Amanda Herring. And she says, thanks to you all for a great discussion. I was wondering if you could touch on the connections between your museums and their universities. Is there a difference in how university museums approach issues of display and inclusion in education than other types of museums? And I think after this question, um, we'll uh, do our concluding remarks and thanks. Uh, So I'll close the Q&A session after this question. Um, go for it, Rebecca, if you want. Right, I don't, you know, I'm just, uh, I could talk, yeah, I always joke, something about Zoom makes me really talkative, and I don't know what that is. Maybe it's because I'm in a room by myself, and I'm really good at talking to myself, but uh, that's another reason that I talked about the history of our museum. It's really wild. So uh, USCPM, like I said, we've, we have been part of USC for seven years, and um and we're figuring out what that means. And then because we aren't a museum that's been part of a university for decades, I think it's it's an interesting thing. And then also because we are physically removed from our university, it kind of changes that. And so I know I've got, a, I, you know, when I was in grad school, my favorite museum in the universe was the UCLA Fowler Museum. And so I have seen how differently they functioned as a university museum than ours. For me right now, it's just that, um, there's a lot more that affects us than, than the university is pretty hands-off in terms of how we're allowed to do things in, in our galleries and stuff. And we, students are not our, our primary um, uh, audience, but one of many because we were already a community and public museum. So I feel like it's a really difficult question for me to answer. I really am happy to be part of a university and that we can tap into our university community for many different things. And so it's our advantage that we are able to do that, but we're still figuring out what that means for us as a whole. Yeah, I think it's definitely, it's a unique position. I always wanted to end up at a university um, art museum. It's the first jobs that I got were at university art museums. And then when I was finishing my dissertation, I was a fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I got to see um, how their sort of inner workings went. and. One of the great benefits also, at least at the Cantor, is that we are not an admissions-driven museum. We do not collect admission. Um, I don't think museums should do that, but um, we have that great great luxury. So as curators, I don't feel that same kind of pressure of having to drive. Of course, we want as many people to come through the door, but we want it to be we want to make it for different reasons. We don't have the same pressures that the fine arts museums of San Francisco do, where they charge like forty or thirty dollars, you know, for a special exhibition. And so you need to have wide mass appeal. So you, you know, put together a Frida Kahlo show or a Gauguin show, um, because that is what can drive through people through the door. I really believe in the research component of university art museums that we produce with our academic communities and colleagues original research that we can also put on display that we can make exhibitions that are themselves arguments that are themselves new research discoveries and we can work with students during within these projects Um, and so i am very inspired by that Um, i think that you know, same as you, Rebecca, we are here for the academic community, but it's not the only community that we wish to serve. Uh, so I, I like that ability to really approach things from a scholarly perspective to put on display things that are not necessarily blockbuster objects or works of art, but are really fascinating, rich archival um, resources that can just illuminate for you aspects of history that you might not otherwise be aware of. Um, and that things that maybe if you had that pressure at a big major museum that everything needs to just be like a top tier piece, we're, that's just not what we're gonna do. But I find that to be a great, makes it a great place for discussion and research. Here, here, here. I love yeah. that. That's, that's for us, cause we're like eight miles from our campus, which is like 800 light years in LA time. Yeah. It makes it so, difficult to figure out how to do exactly what you're talking about. It's a goal of mine to be able to utilize the research community more. Thank you again to you both and to our audience. Um, This has been a really great conversation. It really, you know, Rebecca and I were chit-chatting about this earlier that 
uh, we could have a whole symposium, right? Multi-day symposium on just this very question. Um, so I thank you for such a rich conversation in just an hour. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to Karen for concluding remarks. But again, thank you to you and our audience uh, and everyone here at LMU. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I, I, I appreciate so much being able to take this in as a museum lover and also um, working on a campus. And I love what you started out with, Elisa, to talk about the contested spaces of museums according to CNN. And it, it does also give me hope because um, these spaces matter. Um, that art and representation matters. And to the student who asked about you know, working, I think that um, what uh, Dr. Rebecca Hall said about there being no one way, no right way. And I think that's one of the misconceptions that I, I experience in the field um, also is that there's one way that things need to be done. And maybe that's how we've been trained, but the more that we open up and consider other possibilities and probing and questioning, the better off our field becomes. I want to just say this is the final Collidal LA of the 2020-2021 school year. It's been a delight to work with my colleagues um, across the courtyard in art and art history. I look forward to seeing you back in the Burns Fine Arts Center in person, in real life. Um, thank you to the people behind the scenes. Um, Emma, Molly, Arturo, Keith, to the Dean's Office, CFA, and Brian Keith Alexander. Thanks to everyone. Um, thank you, LMU. And I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter. Take care, everyone. <laughs>